This fort tucked away in far off Bundi is often held up as an example of how we need to conserve our heritage. Exquisitely painted, it is in desperate need for repair. You will find examples of heritage monuments, large and small, desperately in need of repair across every city in India. From the Vishram Bagh Wada, the house of the last Peshwa in Pune, to the one stately Havelis in the by lanes of Old Delhi. While much of our attention is on saving our large monuments, what needs to be done to save these smaller sites, many of which are in private hands? Hello and welcome to this special. We are in the by lanes of Chandni Chowk in a old Haveli that you can see around us in ruins. It's called the Khazan Chiki Haveli. It was the Haveli or, or the villa of the treasurer of the Mughals. It's uh, from the 18th century and it really tells us a lot about the history of this region and also what needs to be done to preserve it. Joining me today is Swapna Little, author, historian and of course the head of the Delhi Circle at Intact. Swapna, thanks so much for joining us. I Thank would never you. have found this in the bylanes of Chandni Chow, but what a spectacular place it is. Tell us about what this would have been like. Um, this is a typical Haveli, a courtyard home. So it would have had multiple courtyards. What we are standing in is the front courtyard, the more kind of public courtyard. And um, you know, this is where the owner of the house would have received visitors, uh, invariably male visitors. Female visitors would have been at the back. The Khazanchi in question were a prominent Jain family who were um, typically uh, the bankers to the empire. The Mughal Empire is what I'm talking about. So uh, they were um, they advanced money to the uh, army, especially to finance the army's expeditions. And when the army came back, they would, uh, you know, sort of and collected the revenue, they would get paid back. So they were wealthy people, and uh, therefore this house is therefore called the Khazanchi ki Habili. Yeah. Now this house, you can see hints of the old era over here in the colonnades, you know, the marble colonnades behind us, even what we are standing at over here. Yeah. Now tell us about what the architecture would have been like and what are the layers that you can actually look at and see that, hey, this must be from the late, later period, from, from the yeah. earlier period. Yeah. Um, typically the original uh, structure is mostly uh, on two, two floors and it has a basement. The basement was an important part of the structure because the basement was the coolest part of the house because it's in the earth and a lot of the, the family would move uh, down into the basement during the hottest part of the day. So um, that's what, that's the function it uh, served. There are um, open colonnades all around the mm. courtyard. They have of course been bricked up in part, mm. but um, they were open colonnades. And the open colonnade also was a very nice way of, it, it's a flexible system. So when it's cold, you can put a thick drape on it and it becomes cozy inside. When, um, you know, it's very hot, then you can put bamboo, sla you know, thin bamboo sl slats, which is called chick, mm -hmm. or you can even put khas, uh, which is, you know, vetiver, which you can um, sort of then sprinkle with water and, uh, you know, have the cool breeze go through. And of course, on the sort of maybe two weeks in the, year where the weather is just perfect in Delhi, you can leave it open and enjoy the, uh, you know, sort of natural air. Mm. Now, this of course is also in a deep state of ruin, if, if I can use that word. And it's really sad. Now, um, from, from your perspective or your vantage point, what needs to be done to kind of preserve something like this? Because as I understand, it's also private property. It is complex to take a, a project like this on. Yes, but um, if the owners are, um, willing, it's, I would imagine that particularly something that is just so spectacular should not be a problem. No. You know, this is something that um, they could benefit from. And you know, we have to look at the benefit of the owners first, because it's, you know, until uh, heritage becomes viable for them, it's not going to work. But I would imagine that a place like this, if it is redone and restored, and restoration is not such a, uh, you know, it's not in the right hands, not such a problematic, uh, you know, sort of, it's not a huge task. Uh, no huger than building a house, for instance, you know, it requires expertise, but it can be done. And uh, this would, in it, given its beautiful location, given the lovely uh, stone, uh, all its features, it would be a lovely uh, commercial, you know, uh, 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 property 
which could be turned into a cafe or a, a sort of, you know, boutique or something like that. But you know, it comes back, you know, you worked very closely, uh, Swapna, in trying to see how we could develop this entire area of Shah Jahanabad, the old capital, into a world heritage city. And you know, this is a, a community that is living with history. I mean, they have been here for yeah. generations. It's very difficult to look at heritage, taking these people out of this. This is their home. Yeah. Now, how do we, what did your research throw up in, in terms of, the, is it possible to create an ecosystem around this place? It should be possible to. Uh, Shah Jahanabad, the Havelis are not just structures, they are also a way of life. And that's very important to understand. The Haveli way of life is one uh, uh, where, you know, the stresses of, you leave the stress of urban mm. living outside and you, when, when you step into one of these uh, little courtyards. It's much quieter here. And um, that's what traditional living was. You lived in close proximity to your neighbours, but still in a little oasis uh, within your house. So these courtyards are very precious as a, and uh, every new building that comes up actually destroys the courtyard. Mm. Invariably, there'll be no courtyard in a new building. And uh, that leads to a destruction of the way of life. Mm. And uh, uh, so, you know, you are, you are actually, uh, you know, decreasing the quality of life. You are making it worse. And, um, you know, sort of, it, it's not just structures you preserve, do preserve the community's way of life, living also. So I think it's a huge pity when we lose traditional neighborhoods like these. So what needs to be done to conserve it? I mean, if you were to look at a step-by-step -step process, which is doable, you know, given the kind of circumstances there are, yes. what would it be? I think what is required is um, laws and implementation of laws. That's the stick end of the thing. But then carrot, which is uh, incentives to owners, to investors, make things easy for them. There are levels at which this can be done. The government can do it. Um, banks, uh, you know, they can mediate so that banks can give easier loans to people who are um, trying to restore a heritage house or investing in a heritage a home. So uh, these kind of incentives can be given, you know, relaxation of uh, uh, tax, property tax. That's the simplest thing. That, of course, is already happening in case you intend to uh, convert it to a use that is compatible with heritage. You can get a property tax break. You can turn a residential property into a commercial property as long as that commercial uh, use is compatible with heritage. So these, the whole range of uh, support, maybe um, the municipalities can set up uh, uh, heritage cells to, uh, you know, to give you know practical support to uh, owners and occupiers to see how they you know to address any questions they may have you know one of the most practical problems in a place like this is that because it's been owned for generations by a family it's fragmented and there are a lot of stakeholders yeah. the second is who pays for this uh, mm -hmm. renovation because it's not necessarily the most affluent mm -hmm. part of town either you know so yeah. there are people are, they are these are the two primary challenges and very often in, in spaces like this there is a tendency to you know underplay the heritage because you don't want to get involved with with uh, these kind of restrictions that might come what happens is that when um, if you look at a typical example in this area even when a property like this uh, assuming it wasn't a heritage property it had none of this even if it were sold it would be sold to some sort of developer, builder who would knock it down, build flats, turn it to commercial advantage, right? Mm. Uh, assuming that another different kind of investor comes in, who puts in probably the same amount of money, uh, whether it's ownership or lease or whatever it is, redoes it, but in a, you know, sort of as a restored heritage property, mm. and then puts that to commercial use. I mean, you're, you're not saying that this is being preserved as a museum. It's not. It's not being acquired by government. You know, none of that is happening. Mm. It's still a commercial process. It's still an outside investor coming in, putting in money, but from a commercial point of view, not out of sentiment. Mm. So uh, from, the, from the end result of it, uh, it's not, uh, I, I don't envisage a loss to, uh, yes, of course, it's always difficult for families to then, you know, be able to agree on anything, but that's, in all cases, not necessarily just heritage. But you know, you've been working a lot. I know uh, in in this region, you've been trying to get 
public support for conservation, you're getting people involved. What has the response been like and what do you think are the challenges there? It's hard. <laughs> Um, I think we have a long way to go before we convince people. There has been um, sort of, it's been a very long process of decay. Uh, the problem with Shah Abad is it's also seen these upheavals of population. 1857, a large number of owners left never to come back again. 1947, a lot of the original owners left never to come back again. What also happened in 1947 was that what many of what were originally residential buildings turned into commercial properties. Mm. So uh, because the needs were different, there were so many more people coming in than had left and they all needed places to, you know, they needed commercial spaces. So everything became a little market here and there. So th that was the problem. Mm. Um, so uh, we have a long way to go uh, before we can, uh, you know, sort of, but we have to make a start somewhere. Yeah. So even if I see one or two, one or two buildings being restored, uh, a nice cafe or something coming up, or even a sari shop, which is not its usual steel and glass uh, shutters, but you know, maybe the original facade maintained mm -hmm. and preserved, uh, it would be such a pleasant change. And I think it would set a good example. Yeah, absolutely. Because look at the number of tourists who come here. Yeah. And what do they see when they come here? Yes. You know, they have to literally, you know, uh, hunt for, for these little pieces from history. So this right. is really quite a joke. Now, they've done it extensively uh, in the West. Even in the East, they have yeah. done it in Cambodia, yeah. in in uh, Gali, in, in, in Sri Lanka, etc. Yeah. You know, what worked over there? Was it the government, the, the community, all of it coming together? And how important is the world heritage status, for instance, for something like that? World heritage status is very complicated. You, I, I'll tell you, uh, I worked on the dossier uh, which we, you know, sort of used to apply for world heritage status. For the Delhi government had, had applied for uh, world heritage status and I was actually involved with the uh, preparation of that dossier. It's uh, our idea was that by asking for world heritage status, we mm -hmm. did a lot of homework. We mm -hmm. got municipal authorities, the state government, the central uh, government, all involved in uh, sort of agreeing that yes, we will preserve it because that's what UNESCO wants. It wants you to say what are you going to do to preserve it. It doesn't impose its own um, rules on you, mm -hmm. but they want to know what do you want to do? How will you preserve it? And we had got everybody on board to say, yes, we will preserve it. And this is how we will preserve it. What happens with World recogni uh, state Heritage Recognition, if we had got the, nom the uh, status, then we would have been duty bound to keep those promises, mm -hmm. which we had made at that point. Because what that can UNESCO do? It cannot force us to keep those promises, but it can withdraw recognition. And that, of course, is a bit of a loss of face. Mm. So we felt that once we had got that status, we would, our, everybody would work together to fulfill those promises that you had made, that you will preserve this. Uh, so if that doesn't, if once that doesn't happen, then they, they are not bound by anything. Mm. But you know, uh, that didn't happen. Because it didn't happen. Uh, it yes, was withdrawn in the last minute yeah, because yeah. it was felt that this the area needs development mm. and that would put too many constraints on the yeah. development. Now that's not happened. What's what's the future of this place, and where where do you think the hope is coming from? Because you know it's it's very easy to be dismal about India's heritage, but yeah. let's look at also the positives and where you see some kind of a, mm. a of a of a rainbow, so to say. Yeah, I think uh, our, you know there's been uh, some amount of public awareness has been raised, particularly among the younger generation. And I see even something as simple as heritage walks, the fact that, and heritage walks on which the people of the city come to s explore other neighborhoods in their city. And these are the people who have the stake in a place. And uh, with more and more, you know, sort of these heritage walks, which lead to further awareness and then stories in the newspaper, the press gets involved. So it becomes an issue, it becomes something which people are thinking about. And what I see now is there are younger people who think that there is a career to be made in heritage. There's, there are entrepreneurial opportunities in heritage. And I think that's ultimately going to make a difference. They are going to say that I want to see what I can do here mm. and how I, I can, uh, you know, sort of uh, what is my passion, which is heritage, how I can mix that with earning my own living. And I think that's, you know, it cannot be a, 
heritage is not a luxury it should not be a luxury it should be an everyday thing which is uh, you know every everybody's everyday life and i've also heard you say a couple of times that let's not cut and paste a, a, a notion of how to manage heritage from the west you know yeah. because it's it's beautiful it's nice you can't impose that yeah. in the yeah. indian context yeah. Yeah. explain that uh, you know again what happens is that we often think that uh, you know the levels of beauty and cleanliness and you know all those kind of things that we are expecting uh, when we try and transfer rome to delhi mm. that doesn't work because after all our population is very different a there are more people they are uh, often uh, particularly in his heritage historic areas um, economically a little depressed so let's not hold them to those kind of you know you don't want it to be pristine and then sterile mm. it won't be like that let's it doesn't it's not doesn't matter let me give you a very uh, a good example not here but in another part of delhi chirag delhi village intact was restoring a gateway now there was a little cobbler who was uh, you know he, he was making his shoes and repair these days they repair shoes more than make them in a you know in one of those little arches inside the gate we told him that look we are not evicting you come out we will repair it you can go back in mm. and that's what he did mm. but he allowed us once he was reassured that that for what we went in we repaired it and he went back in and now he sits and he's taking a little bit of more pride in his little niche because he's very neatly put up his uh, you know sort of all his collection of his you know sort of insoles <laughs> so you know this is what we have to we cannot um, take the people out of the heritage mm. these are spaces which are inhabited by people mm. and yeah. once you start taking the community out then uh, you have this problem then you face resistance mm. and then you'll never be able to get anything done so last question like we are here i mean it's 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 got the hints of beauty you know screaming out of the ruins literally but how would you imagine this place <laughs> in the ideal situation because you know you've got like yeah. 200 300 years of history yeah. just stacked up over yes. here i would remove some of these bricked up uh, open verandas and open the verandas up um, sort of repair the pool Uh, uh, maybe have a little bit of greenery grow, going here the pool of course the lovely uh, platform here repaired maybe you can have an open air cafe uh, or you know sort of flexible inside the uh, the uh, verandas as well yeah. and the khazanji ki haveli it was one of the most historic places over here in this lane and look at the state it is in swapna let's hope it happens really very soon yes. and let's hope all the people watching this are also rooting for something like that exactly. thank you so much for joining <laughs> thank you